Hi everyone, my name is Sarah Mari. I'm one of the librarians at Portland Public Library in Portland, Maine, and I'm here with another mystery solving read aloud with Encyclopedia Brown and the Case of the Sleeping Dog. This book is by Donald J. Sobel and it is uh, published by Delacorte Press. So we're gonna do three more mysteries today, and if this is your first time listening to one of these, this is how it will work. I'm going to read a mystery, and you're going to have to listen very carefully to everything that I say, because any of it could be a clue. Encyclopedia Brown figures out the um, these mysteries by listening to the clues, and so can you. At the end, I'll give you an opportunity to think about it for a second, and pause the video if you want some more time, and then I'm going to read the solution and tell you how Encyclopedia Brown solved the case. So let's jump in with our first of three cases today, the case of the fig thieves. Agatha Matson, a fourth grader, lived across the street from the Brown Detective Agency. In her backyard grew the biggest fig tree in Idaville. Alas, Agatha didn't get to eat many of the figs. Somebody else got to them first. Tuesday morning, Encyclopedia and Sally saw Agatha by the big tree. She was talking to Slim Hall and Kirby Phelps. Now and again, she shook a finger at them. I don't like what I see, Encyclopedia said. Sally nodded. Those boys are mean. If a rattlesnake bit them, it would curl up and die. I have a hunch that Slim and Kirby are the fig thieves, Encyclopedia said. Agatha must have caught them in the act. She's scolding them, and they're grinning, Sally said. They think it's a big joke. This could all become ugly, Encyclopedia said. If Agatha doesn't ease off, Slim and Kirby might rough her up. Then let's have action, Sally growled. She marched out of the detective agency and across the street. Encyclopedia Brown trailed uneasily. Sally was forever making wars on bullies, big or small. Slim and Kirby were both. Slim was nearly six feet tall and skinny enough to hide under a racing stripe. His arm muscles looked like flea bites on a noodle, but oh, how he liked to punch holes in things. Kirby was barely five feet tall. His size was no shortcoming. As a junior high school wrestler, he was undefeated. I caught these two stealing figs, Agatha told the detectives. When my dad comes home, he'll make them wish that they had stayed in their own backyard. You're barking at the wrong tree, Kirby snarled. Slim's dog, Blackie, chased a cat and we chased Blackie. We just stopped him to the tree to catch our breath. You didn't, we didn't pick a single fig, Slim said. Who cares if you don't believe us? You're so far gone you need a search warrant to find your brains. Did you actually see them picking figs? Sally asked Agatha. N no, Agatha admitted, but I saw them chewing like mad. That's good enough, Sally declared. Stay out of this, Slim warned Sally. Go somewhere else and unscramble an egg. How could we steal her figs, Kirby demanded. Use your eyes, we'd need a ladder. The detectives gazed up at the tree. Kirby was right. The figs on the lowest branch looked too high for anyone to reach. Is there a stick they could have used to knock down the figs? Agatha shook her head. Sally looked at the tree again. She seemed to be thinking over the problem of height. At last, she turned to Kirby with a knowing smile. You stood on Slim's shoulders, she said. You're wacko, Kirby cried. Prove me wrong, Sally challenged. Stand on Slim's shoulder. Go on. Okay, Kirby said. We'll do it your way to start. Afterwards, I'm going to make you a nurse's pet. Slim walked to a spot directly under the lowest figs. Kirby got on his shoulder. I'll stretch as far as I can. He reached above his head. The figs were still five or six inches beyond his grasp. He dropped to the ground. Now it's my turn. He moved toward Sally. Careful, Slim warns. She likes a fight. Don't worry, Kirby replied. She's only a girl. I can take her. Here's a picture of them. You can see that Slim is shaking as he's trying to hold up Kirby, reaching for the figs. Take me where, Sally scoffed. Kirby spat and lowered himself into a wrestler's crouch. I'm going to enjoy this. And enjoy his enjoyment ended before it started. Sally shocked him with an uppercut. She followed it with a left hook that knocked him flatter than a pot holder. Agatha stared at Sally wide-eyed. He's a star on the wrestling team and you put him away. I can't believe it. Believe me, Slim howled and flew at Sally. Nobody can do that to my pal and get away with it. Sally raised her guard. A girl's got to do what a girl's got to do, she sighed. A rap on Slim's nose stopped him in his tracks. A follow-up right to the belly caused his breath to explode with a whoosh of a steam engine starting up. 
For a time, he jiggled about like a boy with, with pains. Then he flopped down on Kirby, belly to belly. Biff bop, belly flop, Sally quipped. She smiled down at the two boys at her feet. Gradually, her smile f faded. Maybe they were telling the truth, she said in a worried voice. I don't see how they could have reached the figs without a ladder. They didn't need a ladder, Encyclopedia replied. How had Slim and Kirby reached the figs? Now go ahead and think about it for a moment. Pause here if you want a little more time. And I'll go ahead with the solution. The case of the fig thieves. Kirby showed Sally that he couldn't reach the figs by standing on Slim's shoulder. That's when Encyclopedia figured out how the boys had reached the figs without a problem. They'd simply switched position. Instead of Kirby standing on Slim's shoulder, Slim stood on Kirby's shoulder. Slim's longer arms around allowed him to reach the fruit without any trouble. Kirby and Slim admitted to stealing figs all summer, and they promised to stop. Sally made sure that they did. The next mystery is the case of the mouse show. The last Thursday in June, the Idaville Youth Club had a mouse show in South Park to help victims of Hurricane Sadie. The storm had struck Lang City, 50 miles north of Idaville, the week before. As admission, the people who brought clothing or blankets or bottled water or food that wouldn't spoil. Encyclopedia and Sally each dropped a package of hard candy in a box marked sweets. Then they headed for the judge's area. Mr. McRae, the chief judge, was examining a black mouse named Hawthorne. As its young owner watched nervously, Mr. McRae let Hawthorne run up and down his arm to see how lively he was. He measured the length of Hawthorne's tail, and he blew on his fur to see the undercoat. Mouse must have a long head, but the nose should not be too pointed, Mr. McRae told his audience. He noted the other features of a winning rodent. The ears should be big and tulip-shaped and without any kinks. The eyes should be bold. The tail should be about as long as the body and smoothly tapered. I give Hawthorne an 80, uh, give Hawthorne 82 points, Mr. McRae said. A perfect mouse would get 100 points, Encyclopedia told Sally. 50 for color, 15 for shape, 15 for condition and carriage, and five each for ears, eyes, snout, and tail. Since when are you interested in mice, Sally said. I read up on them before we came here, Encyclopedia admitted. I never thought that mice could be such a big deal, Sally said. This is serious business, Encyclopedia replied. Show mice are bred like racehorses. To have a chance to win, a mouse must not only be good in all feature, it must also be a pure color. Black, dove, fawn, chocolate, white, red, or silver. Here is a mouse being judged and Sally and Encyclopedia watching. After watching two more mice be judged, the detectives moved on. They chatted with club members and listened to them share the love of their tiny pets. At five o'clock, the judging ended. The winners were about to be named. A crowd collected in front of the award table. Mr. McRae gave a 10 minute speech on the fun of raising mice as a hobby. Finally, he made the big announcement. Maisie MacArthur won first place, a lovely white house mouse. Maisie slept in a silver punch bowl. What does Maisie get for winning, Sally asked. She takes a step towards, towards becoming the grand champion of the year, Encyclopedia answered. That's about all. The prizes haven't changed since Abe Lincoln was president. 50 cents for first place, 30 cents for second, and 10 cents for third. After the second and third place winners were named, most of the crowd returned to the mouse pets. The rest started for home. Encyclopedia bumped into Max Mako. Max was shoving the last of a Venus peanut butter bar into his face. I got hungry and I ate one of the candy bars I brought for the hurricane relief, Max said sheepishly. Seems like you're not alone, Sally said, stooping. She picked up two Sour Ball wrappers off the grass. At that moment, Amy Dunn, the mouse club secretary, came running up. Encyclopedia, Sally, she cried. We've got trouble. She led the detectives to a picnic table at the rear of the show grounds. Judd Samson, a fifth grader, stood beside the table, which was loaded with hurricane relief box. Judd is our club treasurer, Amy said. Tell Encyclopedia and Sally what happened. A little before five o'clock, I brought the food here, Judd said. I was getting ready to take 
count of what was inside when I noticed the time. The winning mice were about to be announced and I ran to the awards area. When I got back, the candy, the box marked sweets, was gone. That's the only box missing, Amy said. As far as I can tell, Judd said. Was anyone near the box? Sally asked. Stinky Redman and Casimir Tittleby. Judd answered. They helped me carry the boxes in here. They left a little before I did to see what the mouse won. So no one guarded the boxes for several minutes, Sally said. Judd nodded glumly. He said I was trusted with the job of counting what was in the food boxes. So what happens? Some dirty crook steals 43 candy bars while I'm off finding out what mouse won. Sally asked where Stinky Redman was. Judd shrugged. I haven't seen him since he took off for awards. Why did Stinky help with the boxes, Amy said. When has he ever helped with anyone but himself? Never, Sally agreed. I wish we could prove that he's guilty. We don't have to, Encyclopedia replied. What did Encyclopedia mean? I'll give you a second to think about it. You can pause it now if you want to. And now I'll tell you the solution. Encyclopedia didn't have to prove who was guilty. Judd did it for him. Judd said he was getting ready to count the food and the boxes when he rushed to see what Mouse had won. Later, forgetting what he had said, he told Encyclopedia and Sally, some dirty crook steals 43 candy bars while Moth finding out what Mouse won. He would not have known how many candy bars were stolen if he had not yet counted them. Unless, of course, he had stolen them himself. Judd returned the candy. All right. Our next and final mystery for today is the case of the tied up twins. Encyclopedia and Sally were biking through South Park when they came across an odd sight. Two blonde men were bound together by a long rope tied around their waists. Watching them closely was a big woman wearing a blue jacket. Ten minutes to go, she called. The blonde men let out a tired whoop and raised their thumbs to each other. Nearby stood a group of photographers, TV camera operators, reporters, and curious onlookers. Encyclopedia spotted Pablo Pizarro, Idaho's greatest boy artist. What's all this about? The detective asked. It's a performance art contest, said Pablo. You mean performing arts? Sally corrected him. No, performance art, Pablo replied. In performing arts, people do usual things, like dance or sing or play the piano. Performance art is different. People try to create art with their lives. Being tied together is an art, inquired Encyclopedia. Pablo gave a deep and dreamy sigh. The performance artist tries to show life's struggle in a new way. It's meaningful. It's now. It's horse feather, Sally said. I see you do not understand, Pablo declared. I understand all right, Sally said. Art today is anything you can get away with. You have to look at living art with an open mind, Pablo insisted. I'd rather look at meatloaf, Sally said. The remark stung Pablo. He reacted like a rabbit. The tip of his nose quivered. When his nose calmed down, he explained the contest that was keeping the two men roped together. It was staged by the A1 Natural Rope Company. The purpose was to prove that A1's natural rope was the longest lasting in America. No nylon, no rayon, no dichron, all natural, was the company's motto. Two persons have to stay tied together with the same piece of A1 natural rope, 17 feet in length. Pablo said they can only take off the rope for an hour a day in private. The rope company is over in Gun City. Sally said, why is the contest in Idaho? Here's a picture of the two men tied together, an encyclopedia, and Sally talking to Pablo. The company wanted the last week of the contest to take place here, Pablo said. It's great publicity. Idaville is famous. Besides, we have beaches. Encyclopedia pointed to the brothers and asked, Do you two ever go in the ocean? Every morning, Pablo answered for them. The rope doesn't bother them. They time their movements perfectly. Where are the others in the contest? Sally asked. At the start, there were 20 pairs, Pablo said. 19 dropped out in a hurry. He told the detectives why. One of the rules was that the pair had to stay tied together for almost all of the 31, 31,536,000 seconds that the contest would last. When the others realized that many seconds were not just a few days, but a year, they quit. Only the Hanson brothers over there stuck it out. 
With the contest down to one pair, the rope company must be really d disappointed, Sally said. And how, replied Pablo. So, to add new interest, kids were allowed to compete today, the last day. They don't have to be rope, but every half an hour they have to do a piece of performance art for three minutes. He pointed to his left. Encyclopedia saw a man in a blue jacket. In front of him were Stinky Redman, Tessie Bottoms, and Alice Cohen. The men... The man and the woman are judges, Pablo said. He's making sure each of the kids does something artistic. Stinky walked around like a boy who had just stepped into something mushy. Tess, Tessie pushed a stick into the ground and jumped straight up in the air. Alice lay on her back without moving. Good grief, it's crazy crackers time, Sally exclaimed. It's performance art, Pablo corrected. Stinky is acting like a turkey caught in the rain. Tessie is doing standing pole vaults. And Alice is taking on the personality of someone else. Who lies without, who lies without moving? Encyclopedia asked. Bugs Meany after a fight with Sally, Pablo said. Encyclopedia chuckled. Then grew thoughtful. Did a judge watch the brothers all the time? Most of the time. Yes, Pablo answered, but not all the time. The contest is run on the honor code. Suddenly, the big woman blew a whistle. The year is up, she cried. You've won. The brothers jumped and shouted. They congratulated themselves as if they'd done the nation a great service. Art triumphs over every hardship. The brothers will be hired by A1 to do TV commercials. They'll get rich. How about the kids? Sally asked. The winning kid gets a bicycle, Pablo replied. I don't know who will win the bicycle, Encyclopedia murmured, but the brothers won't make a penny. Why was Encyclopedia so certain? Go ahead and pause if you want to think about it. And here we go. A rule of the contest was that the same 17 foot rope had to be used throughout the year. After the contest, Encyclopedia quietly measured the brother's rope. It was 17 feet. It should have been shorter. A 17-foot rope of natural fiber will shrink up to a foot if left in water for a few hours. The boys had gone in the ocean every morning for a week. To make sure their rope didn't break with wear and put them out of the contest, the brothers had changed ropes many times. They were disqualified for cheating. The lone winner was Alice Cohen. She won the bicycle. That is the end of our mysteries for de today. We've been reading from Encyclopedia Brown and The Case of the Sleeping Dog by Donald J. Sobel, published by Delacorte Press. My name is Sarah Mari. I'm one of the librarians at Portland Public Library in Portland, Maine. Thank you for listening, and I'll see you again soon.